Um, the next panel uh, is uh, Mobilizing Change in the Private Sector, um, and it's about corporate implementation. Uh, the, um, the moderator is Kim Sailors Laster. Uh, she's a vice president of energy at Walmart International. And you might notice that all of the uh, companies on this uh, panel are sponsors of this event. I know we've talked a lot about thanking DOE. We wouldn't be here without DOE or Mighty. Uh, we really wouldn't be here without the sponsors of this event either. And, um, but I think there, there's a reason why they are sponsors of this event. Um, uh, these companies care and are interested about and are interested in C3E. Uh, one company said that they didn't want to sponsor it if it was going to be a one-year only event. Um, uh, the, the companies want this to uh, continue in perpetuity. Um, so these companies do care about the role of women in, in, in corporate America and energy corporations, focused corporations, um, but they also have a significant uh, corporate focus on clean energy. So I'm going to turn this over to Kim and uh, look forward to hearing from you all. Thank you, Melanie. Where are they? Oh, there she is. Okay. Just anywhere. It's good. Thank you, Melanie. One of the comments you just made is so very true. These companies really do care. Um, I want to just start a little bit and tell you about our goals at Walmart. We have three broad sustainability goals, which are aspirational, to be supplied 100% by renewable energy, to create zero waste, and to sell sustainable products. Because of our work toward these goals and because of my personal passion for clean energy, I'm so very honored to be a part of C3E and to introduce this panel to talk about the great work that's being done in the private sector. It's also a very timely panel. Earlier this week, on a panel in the Clinton Global Initiative, President Clinton asked Walmart CEO Mike Duke a question about businesses' role in promoting sustainable development around the world. Mike responded that he thought that business had a responsibility and an obligation to its communities and to its customers to lead in sustainable development. In another session, Hillary Clinton added that true transformation will only occur through sustainable development. But then she added, sustainable development will not occur without partnerships with the private sector. So I'm very happy today to introduce this, this great panel that we have before us today. They're going to talk about the things that they've done. They're each going to present about the work that's being done in their companies. And then we'll have some time for questions and answering. Please take a few seconds to read their impressive bios. But let me start with the introductions. We have Terry Wood, from the technology vice president from VP. We have Jennifer Rumsey, the executive director of engineering at Cummins and Johanna Wellington, the technology leader of sustainable energy from GE. Ladies? So who's first? Oh, oh great. <laughs> Good deal. Well, it's a pleasure to talk with you. It's been a, a little while since I worked in the alternative energy area, and it's just great to reconnect with people and see the progress that's been made in only three or four years. Um, you may be familiar that BP started its alternative energy division in 2005, and we made a commitment that we would spend, invest in $8 billion in the sector in 10 years. Well, we're seven years into that commitment, and so far we've invested $7 billion, and $4 billion of that has been in the U.S. loan. So this has been a significant investment that, that we would like to continue. BP also puts out a sustainability report, and in addition to that, we put out a report about our energy statistics, and it's a look at world energy. It's a great read. I have a copy, if you guys like numbers. And we also look at the energy outlook, and the things that you see in this is that renewables are going to continue to grow. By 2030, we're seeing that the renewables will, in the area of transport, biofuels will have about 7% of the overall demand, and 11% will be associated with electricity generation. So it makes sense that BP would want to be part of that growth. I want to talk to you a little bit about our portfolio and how we operate. We have two types of assets, operating assets that are generating revenue right now, and then we have a set of technology assets that are 
hopefully will develop into large scale uh, operations. In these areas, we have um, biofuels. We're in the Brazilian biofuels is our main operating asset. We have uh, three mills at this point in time, and they generate, uh, have a capacity of 150,000 gallons per year of biofuel. Um, that's our operating asset. Our technology assets are increasing really in the areas of um, cellulosic business in the U.S. and our future technologies around um, biobutanol. In the wind area, we have a stable asset that's been developed since 2007 of roughly 1,000 wind turbines in um, 13 wind farms here in the U.S. So we see that as our operating base and would like to continue to d develop and grow in that area. So this tells you a little bit about what our technology portfolio looks like. Uh, in, for BP to invest in biofuels, it really has to uh, have go th through three hurdles. It has to be affordable. We think biofuels in the future will be um, competitive with conventional fuels. It has to be sustainable from the standpoint of uh, the environment, the social perspective, and also from economics and it needs to be at scale, large scale. So our biofuels technologies have passed through that funnel and in all areas they would work with sustainable uh, feedstocks where we would uh, convert those sugars and ferment them into um, bioethanol, biobutanol, and biodiesel. So these, this is not trick photography. Uh, these are not just really small men. Um, this, is, uh, <laughs> this is an energy grass picture and it grows to, the, height of 15 to 18 feet. And this would be the feedstock for some of our future facilities. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the facilities that we currently have and the technologies that we use. Um, the, the Brazilian biofuels, that's known technology. It's been there for, for a long time, 40 years running. Um, in the area of the UK, we have uh, a new facility that should be starting this year uh, on an old technology to convert grains into ethanol. Some of us are very familiar with that. And um, that technology, uh, that plant when it starts up will be the largest biofuels producer in the UK. And it also will be the largest uh, animal feed supplier in the UK. Uh, we all are also in the process of developing technology all the way from the laboratory to commercial scale. And this is in the, our U.S. cellulosic business. Um, we have a, a large laboratory, uh, and we actually have one of our uh, technologists there. We have 200 technologists in our global center in San Diego. Um, we have a, a commercialization demonstration unit that is located in Jennings, Louisiana. And this is really critical from the standpoint of taking the knowledge that we have from the laboratory and scaling it and causing it to be commercial. And then we move that into uh, our planned facility uh, in Florida that would have a capacity of 26 uh, million gallons a year. Uh, in addition, we have a joint venture with DuPont, uh, it's called Butamax, uh, which really looks at a great molecule uh, to, uh, for fuel. It's an advantaged over molecule over um, ethanol from the standpoint it has a, a higher blend capacity uh, without needing modification for the cars or the, or the um, infrastructure associated. Um, just briefly, I, I'm probably surprised you if I told you that uh, BP's uh, wind uh, business was one of the uh, top three wind developers uh, in the U.S. this year, and it is. Um, we have, from east coast to west coast, uh, significant capacity in wind, roughly two. Uh, 2,000 megawatts, which is enough clean energy for 660,000 homes. Um, I think this is a, a big step forward. We've been at it quite a while. Uh, we have three major wind projects that are in construction right now uh, with 630 um, megawatts. Those are located in Kansas, um, in Pennsylvania, and Hawaii, and I really want a plant trip to the Hawaii site. Uh, <laughs> We are also, uh, through the course of this, um, created, I think, a number of, of um, innovations, plus a lot of jobs. 
uh, some 4,900 uh, construction jobs during uh, the development of these wind farms, 249 um, permanent roles uh, in the maintenance and operations of those facilities. Those, those are real, real people, real jobs, and really important. So uh, in addition to planning and doing research in this area, we established uh, several years ago in 2007 the Energy Biosciences Institute uh, with the University of uh, California, Berkeley, uh, where, and uh, the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, where we've uh, funded $500 million over the course of 10 years in the bioscience area. We also work in, with our ventures group. And our emerging businesses and ventures, we've invested $160 million since uh, 2006 uh, in those entrepreneurial companies that are shown up here. Uh, they support not only uh, wind, and not only bioenergy, but also our oil and gas businesses. And uh, I think the one thing that I just wanted to leave you with it, um, you know, BP is committed to this, and our alternative energy bill business uh, has you know, invested seven billion over um, the last seven years, and we have another billion to invest uh, planned for this year. I think one of the things that really helps underpin that investment are things like the uh, production tax credit um, that we talked about earlier today and having a sustainable um, policy format for us. Uh, it makes a big difference. It's changed the way the industry and wind has grown. Uh, we think over time that production tax credit won't be needed because the, the uh, technology curve is, has made it um, less expensive to uh, invest. But we see the same thing coming on with the bio area. So while he's pulling up my presentation, I'll just introduce myself again. I'm Jennifer Rumsey. I uh, am from Cummins, and I lead the heavy-duty engineering group um, uh, for Cummins. I'm responsible for Cummins uh, engines that are 10 to 15 liter in displacement. And for those of you that aren't engineers, they're best known probably for the engines that go in uh, semi-trucks that you see going down the road. So, so that's my job. And today I want to talk to you a little bit um, about what clean energy corporate implementation looks like to Cummins. I just wanted to start by saying that I've noticed a pattern as we've gone through today that everybody here is so passionate about what they're doing. And I think a lot of that passion is translated into the impact that you all are having. And it really is uh, inspirational and inspiring to be a part of such an amazing group. So let me first start by introducing who Cummins is, because as I've talked to a number of you, it's not maybe um, a widely recognized company. Uh, Cummins is a diversified global power leader um, with four complementary businesses. Um, the largest of those is the engine business. Um, and then the other three are power generations, components largely that go on the engines, and then the distribution business. We were founded in 1919 um, and headquartered in Columbus, Indiana, and have 44,000 employees worldwide. And, and uh, based on some of the comments today, I thought, okay, at this point, I'm going to get kicked out of the room because why am I here talking about clean energy? You know, diesel's bad, and you know, and, and so what I want to do is really, um, and I think all of our jobs is to maybe be a little bit of the mythbusters about uh, the opportunities for clean energy in corporate, uh, in the corporate world, and the way that we can influence and change the world and what we do. And I, in fact, started uh, my career and left. Um, a job in the fuel cell industry about 12 years ago to, to come to Cummins and really have been heavily involved in the, the uh, clean energy aspect of what we do. So as I said, it's a global um, company and we're the world's largest independent manufacturer of diesel engines, so we aren't tied to a particular piece of equipment or truck. We're an independent engine manufacturer and you can see that our largest volume of engines produced is in North America, but we have a, a significant presence in China uh, India and South America as well, and also a presence in Japan and Europe. So uh, we have a pretty large influence on what happens in diesel engines and diesel engine technology around the world. And really the focus of a lot of our technology development over the last 20 years has been driven by emissions and how to make diesel engines um, lower in terms of the emissions production. And this chart shows um, how that emissions has, has evolved 
The dark green are the areas that have the most stringent emissions requirements. So in the US, in Canada, in Europe, and in Japan, we have near zero NOx and particulate emissions required out of our diesel engines today. Um, and then those other areas are lagging behind, but also uh, much of the world is regulating um, just a few years behind those, those leading areas. For Cummins, one of our core values is that we demand that everything we do leads to a cleaner, healthier, healthier and safer environment. And that really applies to multiple aspects of what we do as a company. Clearly, our products have a big impact on that, and so there's a lot of work in making our products cleaner. Um, but also, we, we take it seriously when we think about our facilities and the, the carbon footprint and impact of our facilities around the world, and then also how we can be involved in our communities and influence um, um, the communities. And one of our uh, key areas for corporate um, involvement is actually in the environmental area. So you can see there's a number of different company actions, but also policy advocacy is really key. How do we ensure that as we're developing products, we're working around the policy side to ensure that um, it's consistent with, uh, the regulations are consistent with the technology capability so that we can drive technology development um, and cleaner products, but at a rate which the, will still provide a product that meets our customers' needs. Um, and then providing the right incentives to help fuel that uh, technology development. So what has that meant to the evolution of diesel technology um, over the last um, 20 or so years? What you've seen is incremental technology being added to diesel engines in order to progressively lower NOx and particulate emissions. And, and Cummins has really worked closely with the regulating agencies on timing uh, um, and level of those regulatory requirements. And we've leveraged that to fuel innovation in our company and also growth in our business around the world. So as you look at some of these technologies, when I shared one of our business um, units is the components group. So fuel systems, electronic fuel systems, um, it, the fuel system is one of the Cummins uh, component business units. So as we added electronic fuel systems to meet emissions, that fueled uh, growth in the business. Um, then we added cooled uh, exhaust gas recirculation, and then more recently, particulate filters and selective catalytic reduction are forms of after treatment. So initially, it was focused on how do I not produce NOx and particulate emissions in the engine, and then as we've gone to the very um, low-level requirements, we've added after treatment to clean up those emissions in the in the uh, exhaust. And we've grown a business around that, and we've been able to grow not just the content that we provide on the engine, but also because of the innovation driven by clean energy, we've been able to grow our business around the world. As we look forward, um, I mentioned that NOx and particulate requirements, at least in the US um, today, are essentially zero. There is no NOx and particulate emissions from a diesel engine um, that's sold today. And really, the focus uh, looking forward is around CO2 and how do we reduce CO2 or greenhouse gas emissions from the engine. And this is actually uh, a win-win. Um, NOx in particulate was clearly the right thing to do when you looked at the overall health effects um, and impact on the environment. It made sense, but it was more difficult to, for the customer that depends on the diesel engine to, to run their business, right? Really, and, and they've got... Um, as they try to run that business, increasing cost of the engines and the trucks and the, um, the tractors that they're buying has, has an impact on that business. With CO2 regulations, as we add technology to lower CO2 emissions, that translates to less fuel burn for them. And so it's really a, a good story. In addition, we continue to be involved in uh, biofuel technology. Most of our engines are approved for 20% um, biodiesel fuel. And then we're also developing natural gas engines as another way to take advantage of some of the, eco the economies associated with natural gas, but also the emissions levels. And then just briefly, um, another focus area around making workspaces green spaces. It, again, it's about the, the economics. You know, if you can make it make good economic sense, um, it's easy for the business to convince shareholders that this is the right thing to do. And Cummins has realized pretty substantial sa savings from our focus on improving um, the, uh, the carbon footprint of our workspaces. Wow. 
So my, my last kind of key message is really driving change in clean energy effectively requires the integration of multiple stakeholders and multiple aspects. So you've got to be thinking about environmental impact, but also the end customer, um, the shareholder, the fuel availability, lots of evolve, um, involvement with the fuel and lubes companies to ensure that as our technology has changed, their technology has changed to keep pace. And so it's a complex picture, but one that I think we've navigated very successfully. All right, while he's pulling my slides up, I will introduce myself again as well. I'm Johanna Wellington. I work at GE's Global Research Center, and I lead our advanced technology portfolio for sustainable energy. So I will tell anybody that listens to me, this is absolutely one of the coolest jobs. Um, so what I do is I, um, I seed advanced technology. Um, so we look at a variety of emerging technologies. We zero in on the ones that we like the best. We abate the risk and we hand them off to our businesses to um, develop products. GE has a very long heritage of innovation, which we are very proud of. Um, every day when I come into work, um, I see a life size, that image of Thomas Edison over there, who is uh, our founding fathers. It's a larger than life size picture of him with one of my absolute favorite quotes because I think it very accurately describes my job description, which is I, um, I understand what the world needs and then I proceed to invent it. And so what the world needs right now is sustainable and clean energy solutions in addition to a few other things. <laughs> um, I think most folks, um, I just want to give you an overview of GE, most folks um, associate us with light bulbs and refrigerators. It, uh, very, it very much is a very broad and infrastructure-based um, company. Uh, we have three um, businesses now that um, impact the energy space, um, energy management, uh, oil and gas, and our thermal or power and water business. In 2005, GE launched our Eco Imagination Initiative, which was really um, going after clean energy solutions. Today, many, many programs have uh, clean or green energy programs, and that seems commonplace. In 2005, it wasn't necessarily so. Um, among some other companies, we were definitely, I think, some trendsetters in this, this area. Um, and some folks might have thought we were crazy, um, but it certainly is, has caught on. And what uh, it really is about is that we are focusing on driving um, clean solutions um, for our customers and um, working to collaborate in, those, um, in that aspect. Um, today we have over 140 um, eco-certified products, which I will tell you about what that is in just a minute. Um, so eco-imagination really has a couple of tenants. One is that we are going to drive innovation in the clean tech space. We are going to develop products that uh, are environmentally better and in fact, we have a very rigorous certification with an outside body um, that has to prove that they are better for the environment, that it's a better environmental solution. So um, in some cases, this is improving um, efficiency. So you um, use less fuel. In some places, it's a renewable option. In some places, it's a clean water solution. Um, but, but that's, so we're a lot about driving innovation and driving um, clean energy solutions. Um, but also, we thought it was very important to walk the talk. So as a company ourselves, we put in very rigorous environmental standards, which I'll show you on the next page, uh, because we thought it was important to implement that and reduce our own environmental footprint. And third, it's really about driving the conversation. So we didn't want this just to be internally focused, but how do we engage um, our customers, our colleagues, academia, really the world around us to all help move in this direction. So um, here are, we, we started in 2005, we had goals um, for five years out. Uh, we had a five year plan. Um, in 2010, we took a look at those and we kind of doubled down. And so these are our current goals that um, for 2015. Um, you can see that, um, that they're actually very rigorous demands. Uh, for example, a 10 billion investment in uh, clean energy development. 
um, reducing our energy intensity by 50%, reducing our water consumption by 25%, and a very lofty goal of really inspiring a competitive energy future. Um, every year we produce an eco-annual report where we report it's very transparent on how we're doing against these goals. Um, here's some examples of how that's provided solutions for our customers. I'm going to go into wind um, in just a minute. But for example, by more efficient um, engines on our aircraft carriers, we're able to significantly reduce the amount of fuel that we're using, which translates into fuel savings for our customers. Very similar on our locomotives, if they have more efficient engines in place, they also are able to reduce their fuel consumption. Certainly providing solutions in the sustainable energy space is gotten much more complicated. There is no single solution and it, um, I think we have local solutions because the sun doesn't shine the same everywhere, the wind doesn't blow the same everywhere, um, the uh, fossil fuel capability that you may be competing with isn't the same everywhere. And so what's really required is a portfolio of solutions. I've listed quite a few here, but they really kind of have the same tenants that, that kind of drive them. And in all cases, you're looking to improve efficiency, improve reliability while uh, reducing pollution or emissions. And you know, kind of down there, the driving the cost of electricity down. Because in reality, folks adopt renewable energy solutions in the absence of poli policy as they provide value. Um, and I guess I would also add that I think it even goes beyond this now as we have Smart Grid, which uh, ties this all together. So I just wanted to talk, I, I could talk all day about all of the great stuff that we're doing. I thought I would tell a story. Hopefully, I think Rachel had to leave, but hopefully she'll feel it's a good story. Um, I want just to talk a little bit about wind. I really think, you know, oftentimes we talk about the, um, the penetration of renewables and, you know, it's still got a long way to come up that curve, but we really should be celebrating how far we've come within the last decade. Um, renewables have really seen, um, you know, 8x growth, which in a decade for many technologies, that's unheard of. That's fantastic growth, and we should be very happy about that. What's really driven that um, is that technology and innovation. It's made our blades longer and stronger. It's um, improved our reliability. We've had better controls, and that's really brought the price down. I'd also argue that this is actually a fantastic example of how policy has really helped open up a market because policy created the market through um, mainly tax incentives. And then really free market competition came in and took over where you've got folks competing. This is good for, for society and that helps improve the technology and drives costs down. In some places in the world, wind actually is um, the lowest cost solution for providing energy right now. Um, one of the ways that we've done this and one of the challenges with wind is that um, wind is intermittent. It doesn't blow all of the time. And so um, you may have heard, in fact, a, a standard that was used um, is that about a third of the time wind produces electricity. Um, one of the things that we've done to improve the value is actually um, increase the capacity factor. So GE um, 1.6 wind turbines right now uh, produce electricity about 50% of the time, so half of the time. So it not only um, increases the value, but it makes it much easier to integrate onto the grid. The last thing I wanted to leave you with, um, and similar to uh, BP, is that GE has a venture capital arm. So while uh, we have lots of really good ideas, we recognize that we don't own the market on really good ideas. And so that we would actually like to help promote these um, in startup companies. Um, one of the ways that we've done this is through eco-imagination um, competitions, uh, where you can submit ideas um, for potential funding from GE and our partners. Um, and we think that, like I said, there's lots of opportunities um, to partner with larger businesses, um, like some of the folks up here. Uh, we can provide a path to market. We can provide uh, feedback and, in some cases, scale. And I think there's lots of room for profitability all the way around. Um, so with that, I guess I will end. Um, oh, you can follow us online. There's lots of, um, I really got to learn how to tweet, but um, we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. Um, and uh, you can just Google us and follow us on the web as, web as well. So thank you very much. Thank you all. So I believe we have some time for questions, if there are any audience questions. I think there's a hand here and then one over here. 
I've been fortunate to have a lot of previous experience with all of your companies, and I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to the behavioral elements of the programs that you put into place. So people like to talk about technology. I know Cummins especially has done a lot of behavioral-based programs to integrate all of this, and the challenge of that human element and the change management that's required. Yeah, so, you know, part of, um, from, a, from a community standpoint, I'll talk about first, I mentioned that environment is one of the key areas that Cummins focuses on. How do we impact the, the communities where we are around the world? Education is another one. So clearly, educating people and helping people see um, the value um, of some of the actions and really creating um, awareness of some of the benefits. So we have a lot of internal um, promotion on what we do with w in the communities and also what Cummins does in, in our own. We have, I didn't share targets, but similar, you know, we've got targets for water reduction, energy reduction, and showing the impact of, okay, we just turned the power off. We asked you all to unplug everything while we went home over Christmas shutdown, and then you come back and you see the impact of that and you go, wow, you know, do we, you know, does that small action actually have that much influence? And then trying to t encourage people to take that into their homes and what they're doing to save energy there. So, you know, clearly it's, um, you know, some of it is mandated, but the place where you can really have the biggest impact is, it, is if you can do behavioral things. And then even with products, there's behavioral things with, you know, how people drive trucks that's gonna influence how much fuel they burn. And so implementing things that allow um, drivers to be educated and more aware of that um, or settings and, and how, the engine operates that will allow them to, to realize um, that benefit as well. I think it is clearly very important. So, so I can just add a, a couple of things. Um, one is that in terms of driving or wanting to contribute to clean energy solutions, I really have found that it requires no behavioral influence at all. Um, you know, particularly the um, the workforce that's coming directly out of college, but even the folks that exist now are just very motivated and passionate about providing new solutions. Um, I will say early on, um, you know, there's a little bit of an education process where maybe folks thought that doing things um, cleaner meant doing it more expensive. Mm -hmm. And so really highlighting examples where, for example, in Hungary, we went in and um, relit a uh, factory with energy efficient bulbs. That actually saved them money, mm -hmm. um, didn't cost them money, saved them money. So sharing stories like that um, so people can really see the benefit and can associate it with, um, with savings as opposed to a cost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, first of all, thanks so much for taking the time today to share a little bit more about uh, what each of you are doing in this space, and it's really exciting to hear about that. I know, um, Terry, you spoke to the policy advocacy piece a little bit, but I'm wondering specifically if um, if you have any thoughts around the potential for collaborating. I know you had a slide up there with a number of stakeholders, um, but specifically the role of potentially working with peer companies or companies that you benchmark against in your own space to kind of build a little bit of a critical mass around the topic of policy advocacy and if you think there's a role for that. Well, I'm no policy expert, but I certainly, since I've been here over the last day, I've met a lot of people that are. But I do think that as an industry, in, in wind certainly, you've seen a, the U.S. wind industry become much stronger, have much more cohesive voice, um, and work together not only about uh, technology, policy, but also the overall safety of the operations and how we build a, a new industry in the U.S. So I think it's important that we do work uh, together with others in the same area and um, having some stability and the long-term vision out there and making some of these big investments uh, shows that I think that we're very serious about it. Want to add? Do you have questions? Are there any more questions in the audience? One over here. Um, we, when Steve Jobs died, there was a piece talking about him and comparing him to Thomas Edison. And I think the missing piece to that was that Thomas Edison really set the U.S. up for a lot of domestic manufacturing. Mm -hmm. And while they both changed the world, 
Thomas Edison really made an investment here in the U.S., and I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about that manufacturing component and each of your company's commitment to doing that domestically. So I can kick it off. So I actually think the U.S. is um, going through a new manufacturing renaissance, and so um, GE um, has uh, or GE Works campaign is really focused on um, new manufacturing technologies. You really can't separate design in many cases from manufacturing because you have to be able to build uh, what it is that you envision. And in some cases, the ability to put it together like you want can be a barrier. So it's um, a huge, huge opportunity. Um, so we've got a significant amount of investment going on really in looking at what are the brand new innovative manufacturing techniques. How do we um, really, in some cases, they require research themselves, but you know, how do we develop them and really institutionalize them and help them enable the technology to come out? So it's a great comment. Yeah, from, uh, from Cummins' standpoint, I think um, we have unique products for different customers around the world, and I want to actually make a policy comment. Uh, one thing that's really important as we do that, we, we'll work with industry groups, and um, we actually, I would say, have a good relationship with the EPA, around regulations. One of the things that's really challenging from a corporate standpoint is if you get a lot of misalignment um, in require, uh, regulatory requirements. So between states, if, if states have different requirements or even some different geographic areas around the world have different requirements and that drives proliferation into your product, it creates a real challenge. So we really try to work to align that. So then, you know, typically for a particular geographic area, uh, we've got products targeted at that geography and our general policy is we manufacture close to the customer. So for our North America products, manufacturing's in North America. For our China products, they're manufactured in China. And the same for the other parts of the world. That, that's, that's generally the approach, and we've found um, you know, a lot of success in the, the domestic manufacturing. Okay. Were there any more questions? If not, I have one follow-up question. And first, I want to thank you all. I'm so impressed with what you all are doing. And kudos to you for being such great leaders and such great companies. And so now I want to take you to C3E 2020. And you've been invited here to talk about the great accomplishments that your company has made in the last five years. What might that look like? Well, I guess um, I had the opportunity uh, yesterday to meet with some of the fellows here. And they were so energetic and they had such great ideas and so much passion for the area of clean energy and the research that they were embarking on. So I would really like to see some of those fellows engaged in the industry and making a real difference because I think uh, the capability that and the bright minds of the future, um, they are going to solve these problems that we've started on. Great. Jennifer? Um, I think, um, you know, I would... Um, hope that we would come back and talk about a couple of, a couple of key things. One is that we've um, seen a transformation in the product efficiency and also much more widespread adoption of natural gas um, as, a, as a fuel source. And then there's still tremendous opportunities globally to make much more progress than we have made. And I think you know being able to influence um, other parts of the world to have cleaner energy. Um, in our space in particular is a, is a tremendous opportunity. Excellent. Yeah, and uh, given that uh, my job is to develop clean energy technologies, you know, I would hope that uh, in 2020, I think we're really going to see um, significant penetration and in more than just some places of the world, uh, renewable energy technologies really being the cost effective choice. Um, you know, I also think that um, globally there is a, um, you know, a real need for clean and affordable rural power solutions. And I hope that, you know, by that time we will have seen uh, many solutions be developed there. Um, and like I said, it's just, I think, such an exciting time. I've been working in the power industry for over 20 years. And the pace of change within, say, the past five years is like I haven't seen before. So hopefully, I can't even imagine what the world will look like in 2020. Thank you all, and please help me appreciate them on their leadership.